Blood Hunt is a free-to-play third-person battle royale set in the world of Vampire the Masquerade with a focus on unrestricted movement, supernatural abilities, and a mix of ranged and melee combat taking place in the detailed urban setting of Prague. The game has a unique take on movement potential which isn't totally locked behind abilities or classes, giving you a real freedom of choice in playstyles, but further development of the game has been stopped only a year after launch which marks what is basically the beginning of the end, as the player base was already suffering from a massive decline with no recovery in sight. So let's take a look at the 8 things that led to Blutton's downfall and its inevitable death. At the time of making this video, Blutton has yet to receive its final update, and servers are planned to remain open for the active player base even after they enter maintenance mode. So if you want to get the latest info on the game, make sure you tune into my Twitch channel where I'll be streaming Blutton every Friday. Let's start off our list with one of the biggest off-putters, bugs. The game released on the 27th of April 2022 after cutting the 2021 early access period short to go back into development. The launch promised a lot of new content, including a new archetype, weapon, ranked mode, and more. But unfortunately, it launched in a state that can only be described as a mess. The biggest issue by far at the time was the hit registration bug, in which your game and the server would be out of sync and disagree on how many bullets were actually in your weapon. This led to you shooting bullets at your enemies, but doing no damage when they connected. Pretty big issue for a shooter game, huh? In all fairness to the devs, a patch was pushed out shortly after launch that fixed a portion of the issues that created this bug. But this hadn't fixed it entirely, and a new bug was born, which was arguably worse, the infamous reload bug. This was a huge cause for frustration as the game could randomly decide that you hadn't in fact reloaded your weapon and force you to do it again, even multiple times in a row. Again, a huge issue for a shooter game. The devs had explained at the time that this bug was in fact many smaller bugs all interacting with each other in what they called a Hydra bug, which made getting a fix out slow and painful for the players that hadn't already moved on. This was certainly not the only issue though, and there were bugs on almost all sides of the game, ranging from red gas desynchronization, causing you to take zone damage when you're in the safe zone, to smaller issues with archetype abilities, like Vandal Slam that would randomly connect to the wrong surfaces, making you miss your targets entirely. A bug which is somewhat present in the game almost a year later. Many of these issues had been found and flagged in the closed playtests that were run a month or so before launch, and I can't help but wonder what would have happened if the launch had been delayed to fix the major bugs and create a much better first impression on everyone, but even a year later the game still experiences many issues, from smaller things like visual bugs or textures not loading correctly, to much more annoying ones like traversal issues and lost inputs. Of course bugs are only one part of the story. Let's have a look at another side, performance. Blood Hunt has always had a very beautiful environment, from the detailed outfits and cosmetics to the amazing details and lighting from the realistic map of Prague but all of this had an important impact on performance. This had been a hot topic during the early access, and was one of the multiple reasons that they had stopped it early to sink their teeth into development time again. Even though at launch the game returned with some improvements to the FPS counters, and a sudden lack in the rainy weather, it still wasn't enough, causing issues for even the beefiest of PCs, and limiting the amount of people who could realistically play the game for the fast-paced shooter side, as even holding a lower but consistent FPS was not possible. Major improvements have been made over time with later updates, but these improvements were not seen across the board, and in some cases even made performance worse. At the time of making this video, I was able to get a mostly smooth experience while streaming on Twitch with my 3070 Ti and 5600X, which are far from entry-level components. As long as I didn't use the heightened senses ability, a core ability in the game, which was not only heavy on performance, but even in video editing, causing the file sizes and processing time to explode. Performance on the PS5 side wasn't much better, as even the latest generation of console was limited to running the game at 30fps in native 4K, or 60fps in 1440p using upscaling technologies. A 120fps mode had been claimed possible over the course of developer interviews, but would require more work to develop, and at this point it was already too late. Being the fast-paced and very vertical shooter game that Blood Hunt is, having mediocre performance across the board was certainly not great, and would have vastly reduced the amount of potential players before they could even discover the game fully, let alone push away a large portion of those who could. 
Another thing that vastly reduced potential player base was exclusivity and crossplay. Bloodhunt launched with a console exclusivity contract to Sony, which would last for a year and a half and would only launch on the latest generation console, meaning only the PS5. There were obvious technical limitations to how the game would run and more specifically load from a PS5's lightning fast SSD with a dynamic loading in and out of the map meaning the PS4 would not nearly be powerful to run the game, but the choice to limit the battle royale to the most popular of the consoles could have vastly reduced the potential player base, especially as we were still in a period that was difficult to even find a PS5 in stock, let alone at a reasonable price tag. In case all of this wasn't enough of a handicap, the game launched with no cross-progression and a limited cross-play functionality, meaning you could not team up with other platforms, but you could play against them inside a match. The developers acknowledged that full crossplay should have been a feature at launch later on in the game's lifecycle, but the feature would have required more time to implement, and with a restricted developer team in the latter months, the feature was never fully finished. There was however a bug in the early stages that would allow PC and PS5 players to team up together, but it required that one of the players had both a PC and a PS5 with linked accounts to work. Once performed, however, the game worked flawlessly with both platforms. So my presumption here is an input-based matchmaking system was the main thing to be worked on, or that there was some specific requirement from the contract with Sony that was never made public. This bug was quickly rectified, however, likely due to the terms of contract with Sony, but no official mention was ever made about the exploit, and that was the end of the only crossplay experience the game saw. This brings us nicely to the next big thing that caused a lot of harm controller support, or more specifically, the lack of. Back in the early access, the game was obviously aimed at a keyboard and mouse user base only, as there was very little support for controllers and no aim assist. But with the game announcing in September 2021 that it would launch on PS5, much was needed to make Bloodhunt playable on a controller, which wasn't going to be an easy task for such a vertically inclined game with loads of movement. Seven months later at the game's launch, Bloodhunt had some very basic settings for controller sensitivity and a fairly weak aim assist which, when combined with crossplay lobbies, made it very difficult for all controller players to compete, especially when going against PC players who had been playing for some time. Controller players on PC also had a small advantage, as they were able to change their button configurations in-game in the same way as you would for keyboard and mouse, whereas PS5 players had to manipulate console settings to imitate a similar option. The surge in player base at launch however helped disguise these issues at first, as the skill based matchmaking would have done a good job of protecting the more casual and lesser skilled players. But as numbers started to drop from other reasons, these issues became more noticeable, and many PS5 players resulted to turning off crossplay entirely, which only further separated the player base, causing longer queue times and more people to quit. Controller players experienced multiple changes to the aim assist over the following updates, which, while it improved the experience, required players to readapt with each change. Controller players on PC later saw the ability to configure button layouts removed without warning, and controllers had no further updates for months until an extensive list of aim assist settings was introduced six months after launch, allowing players to completely configure their aiming experience if they could get their head around the extensive list of somewhat confusing options. As controller players continued to underperform compared to keyboard and mouse users, the aim assist was steadily buffed until it became overpowered moving into 2023. It was only in the following April update, or the one year anniversary, when all controller players saw the possibility to change the button layout with a basic list of four predefined settings. These were obviously a step in the right direction, but this also meant that players who had previously configured custom settings on PC were now forced to use one of the four available options instead. We don't have any way to measure the console player base, but if we were to compare them to the Steam numbers, this was unfortunately all too little and too late. Those players who had stuck through the bugs, poor performance and controller changes were left to deal with the next big issue the game had. Balance. Now balance is always a hot topic in live service games, as most updates will include some form of buffs and nerfs to adapt to the current meta that the player base may be abusing, and new weapons or archetypes are always likely to release with further balancing needed down the line, but Bloodhunt took this a step further with their season 1 launch of the Enforcer. 
This archetype was the first tank-like character to release, and had some obvious flaws which, again, had been pointed out in the closed tests only a month prior. The Enforcer's clan ability Flesh of Marble allowed the player to become completely invulnerable for a short period of time. This in itself is an extremely powerful ability, but the worst part wasn't the immunity itself. To use the ability there was a very short animation time in which you were still vulnerable but were unable to fight back. The issues began from this point on, as during your ability, which lasted for over 4 seconds, you were able to heal, reload and shoot your targets to immediately break out of the invulnerability with no warning. This left no reaction time or counter potential and when coupled with the overpowered shotguns at the time, meant that you could take down an opponent with ease without even taking any damage. This was extremely frustrating to play against, and promoted people camping in closed and tighter spaces to make the most of their shotgun's range, which was the opposite of what made the movement focus game fun by nature. By the time people had figured out that this tactic was very easy to get kills with, ranked mode made its debut, meaning that 90% of all players were either saboteurs, who'd crouch invisible into the very last zone, or people were abusing the current Enforcer shotgun meta. This left many people avoiding ranked completely, causing queue times to skyrocket and more people leaving. Ranked was eventually removed from the available modes, as there were just not enough players to maintain the queue times and never made a return. But this could have been avoided with better balancing or doing something similar to Overwatch, where new heroes are disabled in ranked until a good balance is found. This was only one example though, as Bloodhunt had seen multiple dreadful metas over its time, from the overpowered crossbow in the early access, the two tap melee weapons at launch, the burst rifle in October, and overtuned aim assist in the later months. This lack in support and changes brings us to the next reason why Bloodhunt failed. Update contents and frequency. Bloodhunt was a live service battle royale game, meaning that, by very nature, was competing with other titles such as Fortnite, Apex Legends and Warzone. These other major titles have set a precedent to their users to expect a new seasonal update every few months, which generally contains a new character, multiple weapons, a 100 plus tier battle pass, a new map, or at least major changes to the existing map, and more new and exciting content, not to mention regular patches and balance updates every few weeks. So naturally, when Bloodhunt released and was announcing a 4 week or more delay between small patches, with updates to be set in the further behind those, and contain much less than the competitors, the players were disappointed as this was far below their expectations for the current competitive environment. These slower updates could have been explained with a large boost of content like the usual seasonal updates other games provide, but when the updates landed with much less than expected, and the new content feeling rushed, players were once again left feeling disappointed. The game moved away from classic seasonal updates after Season 2, as they were not able to keep up with the high expectations from players, and instead focused each update on a particular part of the game, such as a weapon or a class. These smaller updates were more frequent than originally planned at launch, and were generally great improvements on the game, with some updates even bringing back many players. But unfortunately, in December 2022, with the dangerously low player base at the time, the developers decided to move most of the team working on Blood Hunt to other projects, leaving behind a small but motivated team to follow through with the content that they had prepared over the previous months. Even though the update priorities had been well set from the smaller team, there were just so many things that needed updating, fixing and preparing, that any improvement they made was quickly followed by complaints in another area. The game was finally getting close to a stable state with Tremere update and balancing changes, but server issues struck and hit hard, causing even dedicated players to move on to something else. These server issues unfortunately lasted for weeks before even small updates could be made, with many people blaming the addition of AI bots in October, which had solved the increase in queue times to be the main culprit. Many of the updates that came after the game's launch improved or added in basic functionality to the game that, arguably, should have been included before the full launch, but the frequency and contents of these updates was just not up to the standards that players expect in today's competitive market. And with a major lack in anything to grind outside the battle pass, which was quick to finish for above average players, the game had little to no replayability for those dedicated players 
who had stuck through all the ups and downs until this point. Another reason why Bloodhunt fell behind their competition was marketing. Outside some trailers during early access, and leading up to the game's launch, there was a major lack in promoting the game to potential new players. This, of all things, made some sense from a financial point of view, as any promotion they could have done post-launch would have only brought people into the game when it was in a buggy and unstable state. There was, however, a huge charity event hosted just after the launch of the game, which included some major names in gaming like Shroud. This helped reach a fairly wide audience, but past this, I believe the main focus had been shifted into fixing the game rather than promoting it. The main complaints from some of these top creators having still not been addressed, and with the player base dropping rapidly, it was no surprise to not see them return later on. The last promotional trailer the game saw was made for the August update, which included a new 30 tier battle pass and a twist on the already existing TDM mode. So far from the biggest update, there have been some smaller teaser videos released from the concentrated team since December, but these were more comparable to update teasers than fully blown trailers. Understandably so, as the team would have likely been lacking both funding and resources at the time. One of the common things to hear from players who had discovered and enjoyed Blood Hunt in the later stages was that neither they nor their friends had ever heard of a game, and I can't help but wonder if the game could have made a comeback with some good advertising near Christmas, but looking at some of their past sponsored advertisements from streamers who didn't even play shooter games, it wasn't surprising to not have seen great results. Blood Hunt did however make quite the impression at TwitchCon Amsterdam 2022 with one of the biggest and best booths in the entire event, with promotional content from the time in high demand even after the announcement to stop development. So they certainly had potential to do well in this aspect, and it was likely due to financial reasons that they preferred supporting the game for longer rather than spending their remaining budget on promoting an unpolished game. All of these factors could have been controlled, but one thing the developers couldn't control was the split audience. Blood Hunt was a fast-paced movement-based shooter that focused on gunplay and abilities, but it was also part of a much larger setting, Vampire the Masquerade. This part of World of Darkness brought with it over 30 years of lore and stories to tell, and along with that, a large and dedicated player base of story-based games. This was a very interesting combination, as you could potentially see long-term shooter fans like myself play with people who had never touched a shooter game before. I believe this created many conflicts in the game's direction and decisions, as some aspects would have been more appropriate for either one side or the other, and as they were contractually obliged to stay within the ranges of Vampire the Masquerade lore, this would have hurt the hardcore shooter players, and the focus on learning fast-paced mechanics could have alienated the story-focused fans. The game had launched with a fairly well-balanced skill-based matchmaking in place, which did a good job of separating these two groups into their own matches. But as the number of players plummeted due to our previous reasons, the matchmaking was just not able to keep up with a very restricted player pool, causing matchmaking times to increase and match quality to drop. This very quickly saw the two groups fighting against each other in matches and mutually blaming each other for the game's downfall. In the end, even with all the issues Blood Hunt experienced, I would argue that they were able to pull off merging two wildly different audiences pretty well, especially when you consider that no matter what changes they made, at least half of the player base would be upset, and the Vampire the Masquerade fans were already disappointed from the lack of a new Bloodlines game, only to receive a new BR instead. And that wraps up why I think Blood Hunt failed. If you enjoyed the video, then consider subscribing or pop into my Twitch streams where I will be playing Blood Hunt each Friday.